What's the word, y'all? The NBA always gives you something to talk about, man. We had a three-game slate yesterday, and only one of those games ended up being competitive at all. But we also had the NBA 75 list being complete. We had some new Ben Simmons news this morning. And though I don't want to talk about Ben Simmons news, this might be a a light at the end of the tunnel situation where we can finally say it's all over. We'll talk about that. Um, I didn't get to watch the first two games of this slate live, but I woke up earlier this morning to do my due diligence. So I watched those games, even though they were blowouts. I had to see what Jason Kidd's offense was looking like for the first game of the season. And I had to see what the Miami Heat were looking like. So I'll talk about all of that after you leave a like, after you subscribe, and after we talk about, well, I want to talk about the NBA 75 first. Now, if you didn't know, this is the 75th anniversary of the NBA's existence, which is a huge W. And once it hit the 50th mark, they had a list of the top 50 players of all time. These players got nice leather jackets and they got the accolade of being the top 50 players of the existence of the NBA. It's huge. So for the 75th anniversary, they were like, let's expand this list. Now, when they announced that they were going to do it, one of my main questions was, what do they do about the first original 50? Are they the first original 50 just cements it in or is there some wiggle room? And the answer was it was cemented in. And that's how I knew that this list was about to be on some other stuff. There were some huge snubs, but none of them were bigger to me than Dwight Howard. Now, I understand some of you may not remember prime Dwight Howard or even really recognize how great of a player Dwight Howard was for half a decade. But let me fill you in. So these are just his awards according to Wikipedia. Um, gold medalist, NBA champion, is a role player, but still played a big part of that. Eastern Conference champion, he went head-to-head -head with LeBron James in the conference finals and beat LeBron James. Won his division three times the main guy. Won three defensive player of the years. There's only two players in NBA history with more defensive player of the years than Dwight Howard. Eight times all-star selection, six-time starter. Eight time all-NBA selection, five of those being first team, which means that he was the best center in the league, voted best center in the league for half of a decade. Five time all-defensive selection. Um, six, do uh, you care about player of the months? Whatever. Um, dunk contest champ. That should have gave it to a 2008 dunk contest champion. 2007, 2008, Dwight Howard was fifth in MVP voting. Cool. Next year, fourth in MVP voting. Next year, fourth in MVP voting. Next year, second. Second behind Derrick Rose, who, you know what I'm saying? Derrick Rose got almost every single first vote. I'm just going to say that, but whatever. So the people that voted for this list were commentators, were analysts, Former players and current players. There are some people that voted on this list that are actually on the list with the W. So we got people that played against the greatest players and watched the greatest players. And I think that makes for a nice mixture of ballots, right? Um, and, and I had to come to the realization that there, there's definitely a scale here, right? Because I think we can all agree, and this is not a shot at the earlier players. I'm not specifically talking about a, a person or, or, or somebody on this list because I didn't get to watch 60s, 70s, and even 80s basketball. You know what I'm saying? But I think we can all agree a second-tier superstar in the 60s slash 70s is not even close to the talent level of a second-tier superstar now. Right? Can we agree on that? Because now we got kids growing up with a basketball in their hand by the age of one, and that's their sole dream to make it to the NBA. In the 60s and 70s, these boys was going to war to come in and be like, all right, I, I guess I'll be a hooper now. I'm a, I'm a licensed carpenter, but I'm 6'3", so let me get an NBA cop. Like, it's a, little, it's a little bit different, but I can't look at this list and see some of the names on it and look at the resumes of the names on it and think that Dwight Howard was supposed to be left off this list. And Dwight Howard is not even the only snub that I think, but I think he is the biggest snub considering the sheer amount of dominance that this man had for half a decade. Now, you can look at the fact that he got clowned for the last, what, six years or so of his career before he's got a championship with the LA Lakers. He was team hopping and team hopping, but that shouldn't neglect, n n negate the time of his NBA career where he was the most dominant big on both sides of the floor. I'm just saying. I, I It was just so weird to me, especially since they expanded the list and it was actually 60, uh, 66 names because there was a tie. They said they will never release the ballot, so we don't know who would have left Dwight Howard off or where he actually ranked of snubs, but him not being on this list was 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 ridiculous to me. And y'all lucky I'm nice because there are some names on this list where, where if I wanted to be... If I wanted to be on some other stuff, I can name some players on this list that I know Dwight Howard would have been. Whatever. Let's transition over to the Ben Simmons thing. I've mentioned this plenty of times before. I, I don't like it to, like talking about the Ben Simmons situation, but um, today was a little bit different. Y'all notice I ain't really talked about the last like two weeks of reports or something like that. Today's a little bit different because we got this from Shams. Ben Simmons spoke to Doc Rivers, Joel Embiid, and the entire team today and accept that everyone needs to take responsibility, including himself. But Simmons informed him that he is not mentally ready to play yet and needs time. Okay, Simmons has to be evaluated now and the next steps will be based upon determination of medical professionals. 
So, now why is this different? Whoa, my light went out. Oh, snap. I'm not joking when I say this is a big part. This light is a big part of the atmosphere and I will not continue until I find my charger. From the very beginning, I said that everybody needs to take accountability. Ben Simmons, teammates, ownership, um, um, coaching staff, front office, everybody played their own role in us getting to where we are today. Whether that be a small role or a big role, everybody played a part. In the moment that everybody admitted their faults, we were going to get on that next step. Whether that next step be Ben Simmons playing for the team or the next step being him getting traded, we needed that baseline so we can get over that hump and we could figure out what is happening next. And today might have been that day. Him sitting down with Joel is huge. I don't know what happened in the conversation, but the fact that it happened is huge for the next part of what is going on with Ben Simmons. Now, this next part, I, I, I don't even know if I want to touch it. There's nothing I can say, you can say, that, that would negate the fact that Ben Simmons might be dealing with his own mental blockage. Um... I can, nobody can look into Ben Simmons' mind to say that, oh, he's faking it just because he wants to be traded. I, I've seen people say it, and it might, it might be true. It might be true. But I can't look Ben Simmons in his face and say, nah, bro, you need to hoop because I don't know what's going on in Ben Simmons' mind. Now, there are reports. I think it was Jackie McMullen that was like a couple weeks ago or a couple days ago. She was saying, I think the next move for Ben Simmons' camp is to, is to call mental health. Right? Or something along those lines. Because if I say, ah, my back hurt, they be like, give him x-rays, cat scans, give him everything. And if my back comes back cool, they be like, you're good, bro. There's nothing that I can say or anybody can say about someone else's mental health to prove that they are ready to do anything. So the fact that they're saying he'll be reevaluated with his mental health soon is, is, I don't think there's anything they could say that will push Ben Simmons to play if he doesn't think he's ready to play. So, again, fine line. I don't want to talk about other people's mental health because your, bro your brother's going through some stuff, too. But some people called this. And listen, Meta Santa Ford Artest said in the very beginning that Ben Simmons was dealing with some type of blockage. And I, I think I agreed with him. Like, like, for him to be in a position to pass up on a dunk in a game seven that close when he is a six foot 11 beast and there's Trey Young guarding him, there's some type of mental blockage. For him to go to every offseason and take a thousand three pointers and post videos online but never showcase that in the game, there's some type of mental blockage there. So I can't say that he's not dealing with mental health issues, but I can see a world where it's not necessarily true and it's his camp just trying to get deeper and deeper with him not playing but also trying to get traded. Um, Daryl Morey went on on the radio yesterday and i don't think him and his team is bluffing when they say listen we'll sit out his entire contract we're not trading him away for nothing we have the prime of joel and Bede's career and we're not going to waste it but not getting anything for ben simmons is low-key kind of wasting it because we're not getting any assets for a guy that's good enough to get us at you know what i'm saying and i think that ben simmons can't probably saw that and they're like oh i don't think daryl's bluffing so let's try to figure out this next step and that next step was him meeting with the team wow okay let's move on to the top the three games of the day y'all don't even know how long i looked for that charger for that little thing part of me wanted to get rid of it and was just like you know what we'll, we'll find it tomorrow but again, it's part of the atmosphere. You know what I'm saying? We got this red room and a red light. See, Red Bulls pre oh, season opener, home opener. I'm going to that thing. Uh, let's talk about these games, though. The first game of the day was the Atlanta Hawks beating up on the Dallas Mavericks. Again, I didn't watch this game live, but I had to go back and rewatch it because it was Jason Kidd's first game as a head coach of the Dallas Mavericks. And I wanted to see what he was doing different because there were a lot of talks about um, um, Jason Kidd going to meet up with Chris Asper Zingas and... Um, Lafia, I had to think about it for Lafia to talk about his role with this next team. Um, Luka Doncic was like, man, we got to do some things that's different with, with Porzingis. He's playing with a different amount of confidence. And we got this whole defensive thing, a whole different offensive thing. Because before, Rick Carlisle had these boys, Luka, usage rate out of this world. Nobody's beating that usage rate. And we're going to have his shooters around him. And he's going to pick apart the defense and find shooters. And that made for one of the most efficient offenses of all time. Now, Jason Kidd took that and, and tear some things down. I have some notes here. Let me read Let me read you my notes from this morning. 7 o'clock in the morning. I first woke up and, and watched this game. Note number one. Doran Finney-Smith is posting up too much. And when I wrote that, he had posted up one time. And I immediately wrote he was posting up too much. Um, because... Listen, Trey Young is not a defender, right? So every game of Trey Young's career for the end of it, he's going to try to get, um, he's going to be hit on the defensive side of the ball. And that assignment was Doran Finney-Smith because the last couple of years of Doran Finney-Smith's career, sit in the corner, catch three, shoot threes. They're like, no, we're going to try to take advantage of those mismatches. And it didn't really work out because Doran Finney-Smith probably had practiced a post move since I don't even know when. We saw um, um, note number two, Porzingis can't take advantage of mismatches. 
Uh, they did mention that Porzingis would do more than just stretch the floor. He tried to get to the to mid post. He tried to get to the low post, the high post, and he wasn't moving anybody. You know, like y'all know that picture <laughs> of Car Anthony Towns trying to back down Demarcus Cousins. Yeah, that's what it felt like Porzingis was trying to do no matter who was guarding him. John Collins was killing him in the post. They got the switches where where uh, DeAndre Hunter was guarding him. DeAndre Hunter, stop all of that. You know what I'm saying? And it, again, it might take some time, but there is a reason. And Rick Carlisle talked about this like two years ago. He was asked, why, does, why don't we get more post touch from Porzingis? And he was like, look at the statistics. A Porzingis post-up is blank, blank, blank below league average when it comes to points per possession, and we'd rather not do that. Even though he does have this big size advantage, it's not something he's good at. Charles Barkley went on to the halftime showing he's like a mismatch is a mismatch, which is true, but if your player doesn't practice these mismatches and the player can't take advantage of these mismatches, I'm not trying to give him the ball during the mismatches. So Jason Kidd tried to do that, and maybe it's about developing the confidence and, and developing him into a point where he is trying to do that. But the Mavericks are a team that's trying to win. Do we have time to be to be trying to progress a player that was an all-star three, four years ago? I don't really know. Another note. Uh, Willie Cauley-Stein shot a jump shot. Stop it. Cut it all out. I, if I see another Willie Cauley-Stein jump shot for the rest of this season, I will not. Well, I'm going to still watch. But it's ridiculous. The offense was not five out, and because of that, Luka didn't have room to operate. And when he got to the paint, it was Clint Capella being there, and it was DeAndre Hunter being there, which we'll talk about DeAndre Hunter's great defense on, on Luka tonight. It was overall super ugly. I do think they're going to get better on this offensive scheme because it's game one under a new coach, but game one was not very good for them offensively. Other side, let's talk about the Atlanta Hawks because um, earlier in the day, Trey Young said something along the lines that a lot of people are counting us out. Everybody got the top three teams, yada, yada, in the conference, and nobody's mentoring our name. We were just in the conference finals, and they played like they were just in the conference finals. It wasn't pretty. Trey Young did not have a pretty game, 6 for 16 in the first quarter. I don't even know if he scored, but everybody else was there. DeAndre Hunter and Cam Reddish's assignment on Luka Doncic was disgusting. Every star player that is a ball handler is going to have a crazy night because you think, oh, DeAndre Hunter off the court. Whew, all right, let's go get some buckets. Cam Reddish is there. Cam Reddish's career arc just early in his career is amazing. They were talking about how he was bullied by Lloyd Pierce, and that was one of the reasons why everybody wanted Lloyd Pierce out there. He had, he had Cam Reddish, who was a McDonald's All-American, was one of the top recruited players. His confidence was an all-time low under Lloyd Pierce. And what I saw from game number one is Cam Reddish is trying to be different. He ended with 20 points, and we see times where players luck into 20 points. Not luck into it, but like the shots were there. Like, I'm open in the corner. Nike, and yes, I'm shooting five for five for three. No, Cam Reddish came off that bench, and it was like, this is my unit. I'm going to take the shots, and he did that. And that's some of the things that we saw from Cam Reddish in high school and a little bit in college, and obviously in college he fell down the draft board, but these are the type of things we wanted to see from Cam Reddish because we knew the defensive impact was going to be there, and now that the offense is coming around too, the Atlanta Hawks are one of the most deep teams in the entire league. Because when Trey Young is going to the bench, you're going to see some Cam, uh, Kevin Herter. DeLon Wright was one of my favorite backup point guards. He didn't have a good game today, but he's one of my favorite backup point guards last year. They got that. You got Cam coming off the bench. Gorsi Zhang is an amazing pickup to hold down minutes while Yeka Kongu is coming back. This team is good, man. And, and John Collins' arc as a defender, amazing. Uh, listen, I would not like to go against this team in a seven-game series. No way, no sir. Um, so shout out to them for getting that win. Second game. Keep it brief. The Bucks were missing like six, seven players. And when I saw the lineup of them starting uh, Pat Connaughton at the center, technically Giannis is center, but you understand. Pat Connaughton at the center, I was like, oh, there's no way. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Justin Robinson played 27 minutes. And I know a lot of that was after the game was pretty much over. But still, they were missing so many players. Brooke, uh, Drew, Bobby. Really, really good rotational players on the championship team were not there. But I still want to do I still want to give credit to the Miami Heat because they came out. It was like this game was circle. I know it was circle for PJ Tucker. It was circle. It was season opener. And this team like humiliated us last year. We'll come out and play. The Bam versus Giannis matchup was amazing yesterday. And and for this game one of them matching up against each other, Bam out of bio one. He got him into early foul trouble and took advantage of that. All of last, not all of last, but like the the postseason run that they had, which is what, five games, four games? I felt like Bam was not looking at the rim. He came out with the aggression that you want to see from Bam Adebayo and the defensive impact because Giannis could not do a damn thing on the offensive side of the ball when he was guarded by Bam. And that's the type of defense that I think the Miami Heat are going to bring for the entirety of the season. Jimmy, Kyle, Bam, PJ, 
ridiculous. Tyler Hero had a baby, so you know he was going to drop 27. Um, so good game for them. I want to see them play again with um, both teams being healthy. And the last game was the best game of the day. But even with that being said, I don't have a, a lot to say about the X's and O's and stuff like that. I, I want to say that obviously watching Steph Curry do his thing in that first quarter was incredible. And there was a moment that I saw when I woke up this morning of Paul George being mic'd up and talking to Stephen Curry like, hey, give us one from the logo. It was like a minute left in the game and Steph Curry shot it from the logo. And I, I said it was Steph Curry's version of when MJ shot the free throw with his eyes closed. Like, oh, you want to see me do something? I'm going to do it. Even if the game is on the line, I'm going to do that. And Steph Curry was amazing in the first quarter and in the second half. Second quarter, we're not going to talk about that, uh, uh, Dubs fans. It was nasty. A ton of turnovers. The fact that y'all turned the ball over as much as y'all did and still came out here with a victory is a testament to Steph Curry going on uh, uh, Supernova. Paul George, second quarter. Don't want to look over that. Paul George in the second quarter, I think he had 18 points by himself. MVP G13 type performance from Paul George. Um, Reggie Jackson started to score a little bit in the fourth quarter. His final stats were four for 19, and he kind of sold me because I took the over and he needed one more point, but whatever. Uh, this Clippers team is good, though. Obviously, the Clippers team is good, and they're going to surprise a lot of people. His team is, is still probably going to be a playoff team without Kawhi Leonard being there. And the only thing I could think of the entire time of watching this game is that Kawhi Leonard sitting sideline, he got an album that's dropping in the hour. <laughs> we were in the fourth quarter, and I got the notification that Kawhi Leonard's album dropped. So he's sitting there watching his team lose a game when he should be out partying. Executively produced. And I listened to the album. I saw who was on it and told myself, I'm good. He said it was part one of like a series. So we'll see who else he can get on this album. That's it though, man. Let me know what you think about the NBA 75, the Ben Simmons situation, the three game slate. Today we have a huge, huge slate of games. But I am going to Bulls versus um uh, pelicans today which means that obviously i won't be able to watch these other games so you probably won't get a recap from me tomorrow unless something crazy happened i come in and, and do what i did today where i watch it the next morning um but a crazy slate of games man i'm, I'm excited to at least see who overperforms underperforms and until then i'll see y'all man peace